Hello, everyone, and welcome to this second daily Commissioner Conversation session. I'm Kate Bulkley. I'm a freelance uh, commentator and journalist, uh, usually based in London, but not so uh, this, this day. Very happy to be here. We're going to be considered today BBC Children's and Education and their prior priorities looking ahead. This will be a very fascinating conversation because, of course, the BBC is a very important part of the landscape. But first, a word about our sponsor for this session, Daryl McQueen. They are one of 70 companies who are supporting CMC 2021, and we're very grateful to them. Thank you, Daryl McQueen. A couple of housekeeping things. There are speed meetings associated with this session. BBC commissioning executives will be taking them from 3.30, but be aware you need to have booked at nine this morning to secure a place. Because of the speed meetings, there's no follow-up chat in Wonder this session, but there is a video follow-up chat that starts as soon as our session ends, that's at three o'clock. This is an opportunity to meet the speakers in perspective on happy media, happy mind. The link to Wonder is down below in the session description in the red box as usual. And before we wind up today, we'll bring you another of our change makers. These are 10 young people, as you know, with something to say. And our change maker today also has a BBC connection to prove these things are not just thrown up randomly. Uh, so now on to our session with the BBC. We have several guests today. So it's, it's a great panel. So I'm going to introduce them. We have Patricia Hidalgo. She is the director of children and education. Patricia was appointed in May of 2020, leaving Turner where she had been senior VP Chief Content and Creative Officer for Turner EMEA. At the BBC, she is charged with developing and implementing creative and editorial strategy for the BBC's children's services across all platforms. And she also heads up the two most popular networks for children in the UK. They are CBBS and CBC, of course. And she leads also the BBC's education department. So big job. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. We are also to Sarah Muller. She is uh, she rejoined the BBC Education in 2019 and has recently been appointed the new lead commissioning editor, Children's Content, ages 7 to 12. Previously, she was vice president of Children's and Youth Programs at Sony Pictures Television with responsibility for Pop and the Sony Music Channels. We also have Michael Towner. He is currently interim head of commissioning and acquisitions for ages 0 to 6 at BBC Children's. And his non-interim job, the one he's doing full-time as well, is Senior Commissioning Editor for Independent Productions Zero to Six. Thank you, Michael, for coming as well. We also have Helen Fawkes. She is the head of BBC Education and News Round. She oversees BBC Bite Size, BBC Tiny Happy People, BBC Teach, BBC Food, CBBC News Round, and the BBC's Educational Campaigns. So thank you all for being here. Patricia, let's start with you. Um, when you look at what's happened, I mean, you've been there about a year, what's changed since you've arrived? What are you bringing to BBC Children's Education? Thank you, Kate. Well, firstly, you know, I want to say it's a real privilege uh, to be sat here as, uh, as the new uh, director of BBC Children's Education and, and to have my, my, my first CMC in this role. Um, you know, this role uh, really comes with great responsibility. Um, and, and one that you know I take very very seriously. We're, uh, we're the biggest producer of kids uh, content in the UK, and I am really conscious uh, that we play a big part in helping our kids' creative industry flourish, as well as affecting you know all our kids' lives. And we never should uh, lose sight of that in anything that we do moving forward. Of course, um, I've been in post now for almost a year, as you as you mentioned before, and uh, hasn't it been an extraordinary year? I mean, in so many ways, you know. We've been dealing with the coronavirus, of course, uh, but also because, you know, I think that uh, all of us in the industry, we have had to make a lot of changes in how we do things and we've moved a lot of things al uh, along. Um, you know, when I first arrived, of course, things were pretty good, in good shape. Um, uh, our channels are and were and are still the most watched kids channels in the country. And uh, parents uh, do trust us uh, more than, than, than other broadcasters. But of course, like everyone else, we were facing some challenges. And before I tell you know, what we have done, I'll just kind of you know, enumerate some of the things that, that I saw as we came in. 
um, you know, um, we we actually, you know, uh, 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 so that we needed to better understand our audiences, uh, what they wanted. And as you know, these consumption habits were completely changing and the pandemic just threw everything up in the air. So we had to react faster than ever. And, and be bolder in our decisions. And this actually included, of course, uh, making changes in how we commission. And I will, will talk to you about it as well. Um, our audiences, uh, we saw them were starting to move into iPlayer, but we really needed to make sure we had the right mix of content and amount of content an eye player to be able to you know welcome them there and keep them there and I have to say that the new terms of trade that we actually um, uh, agreed uh, at the at the end of uh, last year um, actually was uh, incredible giving us that flexibility to be able to put the content where we needed it so you know no longer just being you know uh, thinking as a, being a linear broadcast channel but also you know, uh, a streamer. And that I have to thank everybody in the industry because I know that, you know, uh, you know, it was a long negotiation, but people were really open to these changes. And I have want to ask everybody involved in, in helping us get there. Um, we're now also close, uh, working much closer with the wider BBC content division. So that's good news for also for anybody coming to us as we not only are thinking about, you know, putting our content on, on children's uh, channels, but there's this possibilities of doing things across the board, also with iPlayer. And um, and we know, you know, uh, the, the the amount of, so you, so you get an idea, the amount of uh, children watching uh, our channels versus, you know, moving on iPlayer, uh, we actually see about 50% for the audience of CBBC is now consuming the content on iPlayer whilst it's 30% for CBB. So that, that continues to grow and to move at a pace. And I think that's very important for people to understand when we're, they're coming to pitch shows. In fact, you know, uh, kids are changing how they consume the BBC. And, uh, and basically, you know, ensure, we have to ensure that we're moving as quickly as they are. And, uh, and and as linear, you know, is dropping, and we're seeing, you know, um, you know, TV uh, linear TV softening everywhere. Of course, same at the BBC, uh, but we are also seeing, as I said before, you know, increasing increased use uh, of of our player um, uh, content. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, we had uh, last year, uh, well early this year, not last year, in February, we had a peak of about 43 million um, uh, 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 in terms of, you know, the number of requests that we were getting from children in only one week. And that was the highest ever week um, where we got uh, children's, you know, cont uh, uh, consuming content. Um, and now to answer your question, um, what we have done, you know, to, to adapt to these changes is we have, uh, first of all, broad commissioning and acquisitions team together as one. They used to be, you know, working separately. Um, and that is to, to be able to deliver a content strategy, which we, we need to do now. Uh, we have uh, appointed two heads of content commissioning and acquisitions to oversee our content. Um, and one is uh, zero to six and the other one is seven to 12. Um, and this means that we're no longer commissioning based on platform, but instead we're actually audience facing. We are commissioning to the different target groups. So within those zero to six and seven to 12, we're going to be much more focused and targeted to different sub targets within those. And, you know, Sarah and Michael can talk a bit, a bit about that, that later. Um, we have also changed the way we, um, you know, we get pitched content. We used to have, you know, the, the, the two uh, rounds each year. Uh, now we are open, our doors are open. Whenever, you know, you have an idea, whenever you have, you want to talk to us, we're here, we're there for you. And again, Sarah can, can talk a little bit more about how that would work. We're also commissioning more quickly. So if we, if we find that uh, a show that we have commissioned, from really working really well uh, for for our audiences, will quickly make a decision to to um, to order more episodes. So that's I think a, a really good thing. And another thing that we have done, and the reason why Helen is here today, is we have actually uh, integrated um, our children education teams. Uh, much closer to work much closer wherever it made sense not of course uh, in everything but in some instances where it makes sense we have integrated those teams 
And that has basically resulted in a lot of thinking together, in a lot of new ideas. And I'm really excited to see that some of the um, pitches that, that we're getting now, when we have education also, you know, talking to the to the Indies, we're basically now uh, even thinking about commissioning ideas from that uh, uh, content from that same uh, pitch, both for education and entertainment, which is a really interesting new thing we're doing. So I guess, the, you know, the most impactful thing, you know, that, that, that has changed or that we have done this year um, is, uh, is lockdown learning. Um, you know, we, uh, we basically used all of the resources across the BBC to, to deliver something that was needed uh, by our audience in, in, in a very difficult time. Um, we took something that was already working online and made it accessible to millions of people on, on our linear networks. Um, and actually that response was huge and that couldn't have happened if we hadn't been integrated in the way that we were integrated across children and education. The results were astounding. I mean, we had um, a slot increase of 436% on CBBC. We had 5.8 million online weekly users of, of Bite Size, and our Bite Size daily series became one of the activation uh, pieces of content for children on iPlayer. So this is a real great example of how, you know, um, these, these changes of integration and the way we're working now, you know, can make a huge uh, uh, difference uh, to our audiences. Cool. I mean, it sounds like so much and really interesting. And of course that uh, education initiative uh, earned you a lot of awards as well. It was a it was a great thing to do. Um, can uh, tell us a little bit about um, what makes the BBC different? We all know it's a, a a PSB, but how does that make you different in terms of how you commission? I mean, do you see? Do you have a vision for that going forward? Yes. Um, I mean, it's it's you know, I, I, you know, I come from commercial from com the commercial sec sector, and it has been fascinating for me to actually come uh, to a public service, and and um, and it really it really is an honor to be able to work um, in this company because you know the content that we're making really really makes a difference, and um, and I have to say you know no one of us could have predicted how, how the past year would unfold and most certainly neither did I. And, and that actually, you know, meant that, that I had to hit the ground running, you know, with everything that we were doing. Um, you know, we've already touched on lockdown learning, um, but isn't that, you know, uh, 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 an illustration of public service broadcasting as it best, you know? Uh, so that's something that, of course, as you said before, we, we, we earned a lot of um, accolades for that and we're very, very proud of. But it is because we're free from this commercial pressure that we have the ability to respond really quickly to things that are current and most important and need by our audience. And when it comes to commissioners, as well, we can, you know, we, we, we are there to talk to commissioners at a very short notice in some instances to be able to address, you know, those needs. And, um, you know, as the kids TV market is coming, becoming increasingly com competitive with all these global players, it is even more important that we continue to provide uh, public service content at scale. Um, you know, we've, we've heard this in, in many of the different sessions, you know, for course, you know, UK kids need to see their lives and culture reflected across the screens. Uh, and we actually commission over a 450 hours of new and original content every year. Uh, most of it actually um, featuring UK kids in UK loc locations. So that's that's a lot of content um, that, that is, is, is great for this audience. And in a typical year, we would actually work with about 50 independent production companies. Even this year with, with all the COVID disruption, we were able to commission 32 independent productions, and five of those were actually coming from new um, producers, new diverse producers. We hadn't worked with them before. This is basically, you know, something we 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 really like doing and, and really will continue doing. You know, look out to to work with uh, with diverse producers, um, and whether you are you know established or whether you're you're new or big or large, it doesn't matter. It's about the the idea um, that matters. And of course, you know, it is, you know, our funding mo model is unique and it is a privilege and we know that. Uh, but that on the same on the same time, it really allows us to create, take some creative risks and make shows that would not uh, work for other broadcasters. We actually do tackle subject matters that need 
deep editorial development. Um, and to do that, we, we, we always like to work closely with our production partners from pitch through development into production and actually even uh, into the transmission to help deliver this type of products of projects. I mean, some of these examples I can I can cite to you, you know, something like um, something special, basically. Um, uh, that's a program that which requires intensive planning and support because the country because of the contributors in, involved. I don't think many, many would have dared doing something like that. Um, similarly, you know, we do a, a lot of specials with news round that tackle up uh, uh, issues that the children, you know, are facing. And, you know, this year, for example, we did um, a special on on periods. It was called Let's to talk about periods and this was uh, bringing uh, open you know uh, the area in which many children lack information and which sometimes lead to them feeling uh, uncomfortable about their bodies in a critical time in life so these are really important subjects that we really you know as as a public broadcaster um like to like to treat and tackle and of course you know uh, the range of genres um, that we actually tackle, you know, uh, is, is also really, really big. And we want to be very, very um, uh, diverse in that, you know, I can decide, you know, we it is actually a match how many how many different and when, I have to say that when I came into the business, I hadn't, I hadn't realized, you know, the the array of different formats and and um, and genres that we were dealing with. So from drama, comedy, fact end, game shows, uh, and scripted reality, live shows, news, documentaries, education. I mean, I can go on and on. Yeah, um, this this is this is an incredible richness, you know. Um, so you know, I mean, if if I want to just kind of think of a day, you know, uh, in uh, in in the BBC or you know, you go to a brand, you can you know find a Shakespeare special adaptation for preschoolers uh, actually this year it was Romeo and Juliet and then a dedicated kids news program um, alongside you know a high octane uh, live Saturday morning studio uh, show and then to end your day you can have a really beautiful bedtime story read by uh, some of the most famous faces in the world so you know I don't know any other broadcaster in the world that has this richness of variety of highly educational and entertaining entertainment offer all in one place. I mean, I don't know if you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, really proud of, of what we're doing. And, um, you know, of course, you know, again, we want to continue portraying, you know, uh, kids across the whole of the UK. That is a remit. Um, uh, children from all nations, ethnic and social backgrounds and disabilities. Um, and we do that really well on screen. But our commitment um, to diversity and inclusion is not just on screen. Uh, we're actually actively looking for new ideas, uh, new voices and diverse talent uh, to tell their stories to our audiences. And for this, uh, this year, I don't know if you've heard of this, uh, we did actually presented it in February, but I'm just going to repeat it for those of you that haven't. We have actually um, set up a fund uh, of £300,000. And this is on top of your commission. So the commission goes there, but the fund is to actually uh, provide support uh, to our partners uh, to be able to make sure that we can increase off-screen talent diversity. Um, if you if you haven't heard of this and you want to apply, just go to our website and you'll find all the information there. But um, you know, that's that's something that we're we've, we're very proud of doing now. That's great, Patricia. Let me let me ask you another question. Um, you mentioned it a little bit. You talked about with the streamers growing in what they're doing. You know, it's really important um, for the PSB for BBC to to do what it's doing. But that also represents some challenges because obviously to create you know shows at scale takes budget and they have a lot of money, deep pockets. Um, so what are your challenges going forward? And does it have to do with the streamers or other things as well? Well, Kate, yes, it does have to do with, with all this new offer, right? You know, um, this, these kids, they have more choice that any other generation of kids. So why would they want to come to us? You know, why? Why us? Uh, uh, we're no longer, as you say, you know, the the, the biggest uh, the biggest player in town. Uh, and these 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 global companies, I have to say, and and you know, I've been working for this for global companies for for many many years. Um, and uh, and you know, they're great. They do great content, and they have you know they have big budgets. Um, and and of course, our kids love that content. 
you know. Um, but you know, we, what what we you know our I guess USP is that you know one thing that we do that they're not doing is that we we are really representing and reflecting them. We're very local in that in in one sense. Um, and we are doing that, you know, uh, in the way that that uh, we we make them see themselves in on screen. Whereas, you know, um, uh, you know, in, in other global companies are still not not doing that. So, because you know, for us this is really important. It's very really important that our kids can see British values, culture, location, and diverse representation on their screens. Um, but we also need to balance that with making sure that they have content that they want to consume. Um, and, you know, we, I think we're, we're doing that, looking at our mix all the time, you know, thinking of putting in, you know, as much, you know, of the, I guess, more um, wholesome subjects, uh, but also, you know, mixing those with, with, uh, with fun and entertainment. I mean, there's, there's some, you know, incredible you know, shows like uh, like I can cite, cite you know horrible histories, which both you know does um, that that entertainment and that education in and is very very public service. But you know, we do lots more. Um, uh, I have to say that you know, in terms of of reaching audiences, we're still really really uh, healthy. Um, of course, you know, now we have to use both you know channels and iPlayer, and combined uh, it over we have you know. Over the last year, we have about 1.2 billion minutes um, content viewed every single week, and um, and we have had about 1.7 billion stream requests uh, for BBC Children's content on iPlayer alone. So these are huge numbers, and um, and of course, but of course, you know, as you said, before, we have huge pressure on our TV channels, and that remains. And I'm not going to hide that, right? Um, and uh, and this is this is this is because we have seen the impact of the big tech platforms. You know, um, everyone else is having this this same thing, and we did. So we, we, we are looking. Yeah, sorry. Let me ask you a specific question. Will you will you work with them? I mean, will you do co-productions? I mean, if a producer comes and says, you know, I want to do this show, but I want Netflix as the partner or Amazon as a partner, would that be something you'd be open to? Like. Yeah, we have done this before. I mean, it, it, you know, it depends on the content. It depends on the conversation. It depends, you know, what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to bring the best content to our audiences, right? So, you know, on our, you know, on our budgets, you know, they're not limitless. Uh, but we really, our audience always comes first. And we're going to we're going to do what it takes, you know, to, to make sure that they get what they need. So we are open. Uh, to we have some some shows that we share with some of these uh, big you know global companies uh, was which uh, is a show that we we actually do share with Netflix um, as a co-production so you know there is there is that possibility absolutely yes um, it's not something that we would shy from mm -hmm. okay and then I have one more question for you because we have to move on to Sarah soon but what are you looking for and I think there's something that you want to tell us um, specifically about. Yes, I'm not going to go through everything we're looking for because I'm going to let my team do that. But um, yeah, but you know, uh, what 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 is important is that we have, a, you know, a, a, an array of content, a mix of content that is balanced uh, between, you know, the live action, the animation, you know, and all the different uh, genres that I spoke to about uh, before. One of the things that I have, uh, I did notice when I came in is that we hadn't really invested in animation as much as we, you know, as, as you know, we could have. And, you know, animation is, it takes big risk, bigger, it's a bigger risk, it takes longer, you know, lead times, and maybe that was the reason we hadn't invested as much on animation also you know animation uh, you know probably in the past there wasn't an, a notion that animation could reflect you know kids lives but i think you know animation has moved has, uh, in different ways and has really developed in in this in the years and now animation really can reflect children's lives in in so many ways so uh, one of the things that um that i i wanted to announce today and then i'll, I'll let my my team talk about what we're looking for um is a new uh initiative that we're launching today here um uh, can we can we show the slides so i can i can actually tell you what it is so um basically this is um this this uh, new initiative is called Ignite, 
Um, I'm really delighted to be able to, to, to announce it today. And what is Ignite about? Well, Ignite uh, is, uh, is, is, an, is a, a new initiative and we're looking for animation ideas um, that reflects the lives and culture of kids growing up in the UK today. Uh, we want submissions from both established producers and emerging creative talent. The initiative will consist of three stages, the first of which will see up to 20 ideas given an initial funding pot. Uh, and further funding will be allocated at stages two and three of the submissions that will make it through each round. Um, we will actually be looking for um, you know, uh, talent and creators um, uh, from all different uh, places, whether you are part of a company or not. But if you are a sole creator um, who make it through the first stage, uh, you will be paired with, uh, with a creative team to help build and develop uh, your idea. Um, we will, of course, be looking for originality in the ideas, but really rooted in Britishness, in British culture. This is the thing that we want to be very clear about. It has to be about, um, you know, it has to be relevant to, to, to British children. It has to be, uh, you know, quintessentially British, basically. Um, and of course, you know, sorry. No, that's fine. I, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm, keep talking. Yep. Basically, I'm not going to, to go up, uh, more on that, but um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just, uh, you know, let let uh, uh, Sarah talk more about this. But this is this is very exciting to us. Before we move to Sarah, Patricia, we have one question from the mm -hmm. audience, and by the way, do do put them in the question app. Um, You've talked a lot about, you know, British culture and the relevancy for British children is obviously being the main USP, but you also said we have to balance it with entertainment. So a question from the floor, which came in anon anonymously said, you know, little baby bum um, is something that you have on the BBC. It's made by Moonbug in America. And this questioner says it does not reflect the lives of UK children on screen. So why are you chasing a YouTube, a YouTube audience? at the expense of quality when this is not the role of the BBC? So can you, I, that's a quite an aggressive question. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's, and it's a very fair question, you know, and I, I would I, I would have asked that to myself before I decided to to go into this space. Well, first of all, I want to say little baby bag, the baby bag I was with, little baby palm, <laughs> was not, it, it was actually uh, created by a UK, couple and they were mm. they had their own I, I probably can you know the story yeah they had their own uh, um, little children child actually and they were looking for nursery rhymes something to entertain you know their, their kid and there was nothing out there we were making it so off they went and make their own and then they put it on on youtube and hey started getting all this audience it was something the audience wanted and needed and nobody was making it, and they made it, and they are and they are actually British. So I don't know, you know. Um, of course, you know it's little uh, nursery rhymes. Of course, the Moonbag bought the the property, so yes, it now belongs, you know, to Moonbag. But this is a British show, and some of the best animation uh, animated, you know, preschool is coming from the UK, and we should be very proud of that, and we should celebrate that. So I wanted to celebrate this. I wanted to bring it back almost kind of bring it back home you know and but not only that what i wanted to do with with a little baby bum is i wanted to you know bring something that our audiences love which you know and if you watch little baby bum it the values are, are wonderful you know it's a very little little series of of nursery rhymes it couldn't be sweeter and and it does is 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 not I wouldn't say it's cheap or, or, or bad content at all. And, and I, I just wanted to create, you know, a place where it's a safe place where all children can come and they can have all that content that otherwise they need to go to YouTube to consume or elsewhere to consume, right? So we have a place, we have a safe haven for you and your children. Uh, on iPlayer. We've got all our fantastic, you know, originals, but we have some, you know, great creative uh, content from UK creators as well that is that is loved by your audience. So that's, that's, I hope that's a simple answer. Thank you so much. Patricia, thank you for all your answers. Um, I'm going to now move on to Sarah, but thank you so much for being with us. 
So Sarah Mueller, your lead commissioning editor of children's content for ages seven to 12. Sarah, we, um, Patricia talked a lot, little bit about Ignite. Is there something else you wanna say about that in terms of what producers need to know? Well, she covered it pretty well in the end. Uh, I think all I can add is that we really are genuinely very excited. I think people that know me know I'm incredibly passionate about animation, British animation, animation from different voices and telling different stories and how we might do this. And this is the first opportunity we've had at the BBC to do something like this, where we've got some proper funding behind it and we can actually walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Uh, all the details are on the commissioning website. As of today, it's gone live. I can tell you that the closing date is August the 15th. Uh, we are taking, because we absolutely want this to be open to everybody, this is the people's animation call out. So it's everyone from individuals and students and writers and creatives and designers through to big studios and production companies. It's everybody's opportunity on a level playing field to get content in us. And it's a staged, tiered activity and that will go down to a cut of 20 I won't go into what all the stages are now because we run out of time. From there, we'll go to six, and from there, we'll go to three. It's a naught to 12 scheme. It's not just for seven plus, and we can't wait to get started. We're very excited. That's great. So talk a little bit about your, your role, um, your new role, and how it's gonna work in terms of how you're going to interface with the, the producers. Okay, well, to be honest, it's not, broke and it's not being fixed it's just a case of cutting things up differently and roles and using that opportunity to rethink how we did things in a certain way uh we've done things the same way for quite a long time and this is a real opportunity and i'm pleased to be part of it to think slightly differently and part of what i consider it to be the future proofing of the bbc for the you know, as of our business. So it's taken the role of the acquisitions department and the role of the commissioning department and put them together so that there's always an holistic conversation happening that all of the executives working within those two teams have been pulled so there's much more of a conversation. And then really thinking about where children are and what children want in the way that they approach content, in the self-scheduling way they approach content. So that's, you know, they make choices. So to say this is tied to that platform where we've decided what you're going to watch, as opposed to we're going to think about what your different needs might be when there's a myriad of choice and make sure we've got something for everybody. Because I can tell you, when you really start to look like that, even at the BBC who has some of the best content in the world we miss bits you miss age groups you don't think about them you look and you realize that you've potentially selected lots of quite similar tonally similar content so this is for me been a real eye-opener and it's a real opportunity it also means that in a world where we have to be realistic being able to think on a business with a business hat on as well at the same time probably speeds things up and that will then feed into how we're going to make the year round commissioning work. I'm just going to quickly tell you an anecdote about the, the year round commissioning. I was there in the meeting when they announced some years ago, I was at an indie, that they were going to go from year round rolling commissioning to scheduled event commissioning and everybody was really, really upset about it. So for me, this is your organic opportunity to tell, to bring your ideas at the time they're ready to bring rather than get lost in the noise of a mass event twice a year. Um, this is speaking as an ex-producer, I far prefer this notion of just being able to come at the rhythm and pace of when you think it's the right time. No, I, I agree with you. I think it's really a good idea. I've got a question from the audience I'm going to throw in here. It says, um, you mentioned, this is from uh, David, sorry, Dave Kasky. You mentioned the importance of representing British culture. Could you give some more information on how you would see this best represented? Well, it's that's a very wide answer because as we're a microcosm of the BBC and you heard Patricia outline, not even all of the different things we do across our different departments, um, we will have a different approach for everything. But the stories we're interested in telling are always about are always of something that will interest the audience. We must remain relevant. So 
we will be looking for new suppliers. We will be looking for diverse suppliers and producers to work across all of our genres. We will be looking for interesting stories and ways to tell them. And that hasn't changed. That's not a new thing. This is what we've always done. What we have done this year, which feels like a real step forward, is make sure that some of these notions around sustainability, diversity and inclusion are really embedded in what we do, rather than us all thinking it's quite a nice thing to do as an audience. So that's where we'll be looking for the change. Uh, Patricia touched on the diversity funding. It's very important for us. I'd also like to just commend at this point one of the things I missed most when I wasn't at the BBC, which is the writer's room. It's just one of the unique things that we have that makes sure we're constantly finding, discovering, developing and bringing on new talent, not just for ourselves, but also for all of our indies, suppliers and producers that we work with. You know, it's a resource that's open to all. What programming is working now? What what would you, you know, can you highlight some to give us? Give Absolutely. The producers it feeds into this what are the points of difference so we all agree that there's a lot of competition out there and that it's significantly well resourced so we're always looking for the points of difference and i think that comes when we bring the story closer to our audience i think there's things about british culture which are very interesting internationally so i'm not seeking to make very localized content. I want things to be popular and big and to feel aspirational and to have ambition. But when you look at something like Mallory Towers, The Worst Witch, also British, British creator, but also made hitting what we are at a time when the entire country needed positive, positive content to watch together as a family. That's definitely provided it. Uh, Tracy Beaker, the big keynote at four o'clock, please watch. We brought my mum, Tracy Beaker back this year, so successfully, so proud to be part of something that resonates that well, that works. Um, we have horrible histories already mentioned by Patricia, but also think too about Operation Ouch, which hasn't just resonated across children's, but has allowed a breakout for that platform and that way to talk about health issues across the rest of the the broadcast landscape. Our school, boy, girl, cat, dog, mouse, cheese, a real opportunity to find an animation which we broke that is beginning to build. Um, not sadly made in the UK, made in Ireland, but now we'll be looking for something that's like that to come in behind. Cool. And in terms of what you're looking for, you've oh. kind of touched on anything in specific that you want. Um, and also that if you could maybe wend in this idea of digital first is that is there an idea of digital first i know you're talking about plat platform agnostic but oh, yes. do you think about play on iplayer how's it play in the channel how does that work in terms of what you want well, it's all very joined up now kate actually um one of the things that patricia has moved through very speedily is, is discussions amongst the groups in the bigger bbc we speak often to the iplayer team about now what everybody's needs are, how we are going to arm them with what they need to make that plus platform a destination, a lasting destination for all age groups. So that's one of the ways. But I think everybody just needs to join us in the idea that we're going to be doing things differently. We're going to be trying things on iPlayer first. We're going to be trying things iPlayer only. And that no one is to be concerned about that because it's all part of bringing great content to where the audience are rather than trying to persuade them to come back from somewhere else. Although we might try some of that as well, to be honest. Mm, cool. Any Anything specific you're looking for? And I'll move on to Michael. Um... Well, we really, really animation. We have world-class drama. We make the best factual for children in the entire world. It wins awards wherever it goes, and we have great fact ent. We have a beautiful preschool animation, but we just haven't managed as well in the 7-plus animation space. We know how to do it. I insist we know how to do it. I insist we have the skills here, and we are going to do it, and Ignite is the first step. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, CMC. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, Michael, let's get on to you. Michael Towner, he is uh, Interim Head of Commissioning and Acquisitions for Agents at BBC Children's. He's also got a full-time job as Senior Commissioning Editor for Independent Pr Productions, ages zero to six. So, Michael, what's what's working for the zero to six age group? 
Uh, hi, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, well, what's working for us is is kind of the same as it has always worked for us because that age segment of the audience then needs tend to be pretty fixed and they don't change much. It's at such an early stage of their development that what works for them kind of stays the same. So what's working for us uh, at the moment particularly is Bluey, uh, which is our fantastic animation acquisition from Australia by BBC Studios, which I'm sure if everyone in this room will have seen it. Um, if you haven't, just go and look at it. It's just hilariously funny. It's warm, it's inclusive, it's clever. It has lovely jokes which are for the grown-ups, but it never leaves the kids behind. So, brilliant. Um, Bing, Hey Dougie, Octonauts, our usual juggernauts, which are always there. They always do well because they're brilliant, and that's the reason they do well. Uh, the Andy's Adventure Strand, which is live-action NHU. All the CBBS Presents titles, the live-action stuff, which is one of the few places that you can see all your favorite presenters in one place. So we did it at Christmas time. We did it with Christmas's Storyland last year. We did Romeo and Juliet, and we did Monday Night's Dream. Who else is going to bring you Shakespeare for, for four-year-olds, for goodness sake, but us? <laughs> and yay for us and in-house. Um, and bo incidentally, both of those productions were filmed under lockdown conditions last year, and still they churned out amazing content. So well done, in-house. Justin's House, Tops and Tim, Number Blocks, Waffle, The Wonder Dog, Clangers, Our Family, anything where kids uh, see themselves and see their, their lives and the lives of people like them reflected back to them, as, as Patricia and Sarah have both said uh, ad nauseum today, that always resonates with our audience. And so those things, unsurprisingly, continue to do well, always. And what are you looking for um, coming up, uh, you know, the next sort of 12 to 18 months? What, what would you like to see coming through your door? Well, if I'm honest, I'm always a little bit loath to answer this and with too many specifics, um, simply because, and the reason for this is, and I've said this to lots of people watching today, uh, we have such small, relatively small budgets, small slots, so the minute you start to say, I'm looking for X, you tend to get 5,000 pitches for X and nothing else. So it's a slightly dangerous road to go down, uh, and it's one I'm always a little bit loath to do. So suffice to say, I want the full range and richness and depth of all the propositions that people always bring to us. History, geography, music, sports, art, science, game shows, drama, fact tent, you name it. I want to see it. Um, everybody knows that we're going to be commissioning more volume of fewer titles going forward. That's not a, a secret. That's, a, that's what we stated out to do. So it means that a lot of my time will be spent saying thanks, but no thanks, which is a hideous position to be in. But such as life. So uh, don't restrict yourselves would, would be my message to producers. Come to me with your ideas. As long as they're A, brilliant, B, unique, uh, do something that nobody else is doing, or at least does something in a new way, because let's face it, we're all reinventing the wheel most of the time in this business. Uh, it has to have high impact and, and that can mean a myriad of things. It might mean that it's got international value. It might mean that it's just multi-platform in, in myriad of ways that we can really sell it and really push it there. If it's self-advertising, self-promoting, yay, you've done half the job for us. Thank you for that. Thank you. So yeah, don't restrict yourselves. Bring us all the best ideas uh, and let us take them in gratefully uh, and, and thank you for them. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Michael. I, I know that you'll, I'm sure you get some brilliant ideas coming through your door we, soon. We, we always do. And, and, and to the waiting, watching crowd who supply us, thank you. It's really, really appreciated. Thank you all. Cool. It'll be, it'll be it'll be good, and of course they get to do more to do more episodes. So that's always good. If you get a good idea, you get you get to do more of it. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to uh, Helen. Helen Fawkes. Uh, she's head of BBC Education and News Round. So uh, Helen, welcome. And does education? How does education work within the wider children's team now? I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's lovely to be here on this panel today with my uh, children's colleagues and with Patricia. And I think under Patricia's leadership, um, she's really brought children's and education together to work together to kind of make as much impact as we can, uh, you know, what, across our platforms, you know, across the channel, across iPlayer and across online. Um, what I might do is just sort of quickly kind of talk through what education does and, and, and touch on where we've, we've collaborated across with our, our, our colleagues and children's. It's been really, really effective so far. 
Um, so first of all, we've got Bite Size. So Bite Size is the BBC's education service online for five to 16 year olds. Uh, it's a mixture of video and quizzes and text and infographics um, and some brilliant games as well. Uh, and we're doing some great collaborations with, you know, uh, some brands that have already been mentioned, Horrible Histories and Operation Ouch. Uh, you know, we, we know that, 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 that uh, Horrible Histories brings history to life. Uh, and working really closely together with, with that team and with the Bite Size team, we can kind of pull out the key salient points for key stage to history that teachers want to teach in the classroom. And they can do it in a really fun, interactive way uh, through a game. That, so that's sort of bringing two big brands together uh, and serving to you know serving the audience in a really good way who wouldn't want to play horrible histories in the classroom um we also have bbc teach uh, and that's uh, our, our kind of a, a service where we where teachers can uh, have curriculum relevant uh, quality video to use in the classroom you know, as inspiration you know to tackle tricky subjects you know as a starter for the lesson uh, and, and we work across you know all of the bbc's uh, kind of uh, programs with that we work in collaboration with lots of different areas Areas, children's news and current affairs depending on what the subject is we've done some amazing things uh, with small acts um, earlier last year uh, the small acts drama uh, and brought those suitable for the classroom for that uh, GCSE uh, um, cohort it was really great collaboration so we do that both with our children's colleagues and with and across the BBC. Uh, we have Tiny Happy People, as you mentioned, Kate. Uh, so Tiny Happy People is our uh, initiative uh, to help reduce the language gap. Uh, so so um, we're, we're looking at, at supporting parents to, to help their child with their language development. Uh, and and um, we do that uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, lots of uh, you know great short uh, one minute one message content uh, online uh, and on social, uh, as well as activations uh, in in the communities uh, through our community hubs. Uh, and we had a lovely collaboration uh, with um, the Baby Club uh, for this. As you know, so Patricia said at the top, thinking about that commission in in way contents can work for the channel, but also for education has been really, really valuable. We got lots of films um, from the Baby Club with Gianna Fetcher modeling, you know, great um, uh, ways in which you can play with your, your child to, to, to do that language, that, that sort of language development. So, you know, some great, a great film about fun with mirrors and, and with our kind of tiny happy people, what's in the bag uh, game, which is brilliant. Uh, you know, bring something out talk about it, make a story with your child. Um, so that's tiny happy people. We also have our education campaigns um, that, that we we run at um, different periods throughout the year. Our next big one is the Bite Size, the Regenerators. Uh, and that campaign is is to address the, sort of the number one concern of, of children and, and young people, which is climate change. Uh, so that's going to launch just before just before COP, uh, sort of uh, on the 27th of October. Um, and as you said, I, I now am um, leading News Round, um, which is a really wonderful honour for me uh, to do. Uh, and it is such an amazing brand and really relevant for today and for today's audience. Uh, you know, it's really well used uh, in the classroom uh, and it is a real key public service piece, you know, of bringing content, uh, you know, news content that kids want to know and doing it in a way that, that works for them, I think is is a really, is what a, the BBC can do and will continue to do. So I'm really proud to be doing that. So Helen, um, just very quickly, what are you looking for specifically over the next 12 to 18 months? You've got, as you say, there's a lot of content. You're, you're thinking in a more joined up way. What is it you would like to see pitched to you? So I think on on um, bite size, we, we 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 are a little bit prescriptive on what we want, unlike Michael and Sarah, because of it to hit the curriculum and to hit certain learning objectives. Um, but what we are looking at at the moment, and we'll be uh, putting commissioning briefs out um, around the, these subjects, is a lot in primary for bite size. So that we're looking for um, a reception English and maths content. Um, Key stage one and key stage two citizen content, uh, citizenship content, so that's five to six and seven to 11, and, and key stage two geography content. And then on Tiny Happy People, we, we're sort of moved up now. We did baby babies at the, at the first year, and now we're moving on to sort of, uh, you know, um, 
24 months uh, plus sort of content for parents of toddlers, basically. And we're looking at content that uh, either explains the science of your child's brain and your baby's brain as part of language acquisition or um, hooking them into into tiny happy people themselves, uh, you know, get, grabbing their attention and getting them to our, uh, our modeling content. And so the modeling content is real parents doing real things with real babies to kind of model great behavior. And we do all of those things. It's probably worth saying everything um, for tiny happy people is done with um, the Royal College of Midwives and speech and language therapists, just as everything on Bite Science is done it, 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 with teacher consultants, you know, just to make sure it's it's absolutely right for what we're going to deliver. Um, what we do do in education, um, because we, we, we tend to commission quite a lot at the beginning of the financial year in April and then have, um, you know, commissions through the year, not quite rolling, but 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 coming through the year, uh, we we have a, a mailing list uh, for, for 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 indies, so we can alert people to 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 uh, commissions that are coming on on stream. So if anybody wants to to join that mailing list, if they just want to, you know, drop me me a line, Helen Fawkes at, at bbc.co.uk, I can make sure that they're on that list and they'll get those regular comms uh, of what's coming out. It's a great thing to tell them. Thank you so much. Helen, that was really um, helpful, I think, in terms of being specific. Uh, we're going to do some questions now. If you do have a question, do submit your question using the smiley face icon. One of the questions I've got in the writer's room is from a script writer named Paula. And I'm not quite sure who it's going to go to, but let me just say it and somebody can pick it up. The BBC writer's room was mentioned, I think maybe by Sarah. I had thought that the writer's room competitions were no longer running. Sarah, can you take that? Um, there will continue which we support at Children's as well. Okay, great. So it sounds like the writers room are going to continue. Um, let's, uh, until we can get Sarah's connection back, let's move on. Another uh, question, maybe this could be taken by somebody else. Seems like the Ignite animation landing page isn't live yet. This is from uh, Eddie uh, from Volcano Valley. Does someone know if when that's going live, the Ignite page? Patricia, do you know that answer? It should go live after this um, session. It's it's uh, it's just been posted after the session, I believe. They just announced it. This is this is news, as we say. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. This is really like uh, fresh news. <laughs> okay. Um, does uh, Sarah, are you back? Can you talk a little bit more about the writers' room or not? I believe I'm back. Uh, I'll answer both questions. So keep your eye on the writers' room pages. There will be different schemes that children will continue to support, making sure new voices from all over the country are represented. And I've just had it drawn to my attention that the link isn't live yet. I think there might be some last minute gremlins. So if you could give us a couple of hours and it'll be there. But I'm glad people are so keen and have tried already. That's very exciting. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. That was uh, that was great. Um to run out of time on this, but as, as we know, you can you can talk to these people later. Um, I really want to thank um, everyone for being part of this, including the audience questions and also my uh, producer, Tim Patterson. Thank you very much, Patricia, Sarah, Michael, and Helen for being with us. Thank you so much. So next up, speed meetings. For those who have them booked, the Wonder Chat for Happy Media, Happy Minds. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, there's also the creative keynote here on the platform. We have special treat Dame Jacqueline Wilson, the author of the Tracy Beaker books and Danny Harmer, who has played Tracy for 20 years are actually coming together, not virtually, but actually meeting up. You're going to see them virtually, but they're actually together with journalist Rihanna Dillon, and they're going to have a heart to heart about the life of Tracy Beaker and the longstanding creative partnership as author and performer. So don't miss that. That's at 4 PM. It's going to be fascinating. Um, there's one big change to the social program that I think I should mention is the CMC quiz, which was planned for 8 p.m. is now taking place at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it's just going to be an hour. I can't imagine why we've moved that. Might have something to do with football? Anyway, so that's happening. Um, you'll find the Zoom link for the quiz in a red box in the session description below this stream. And now on to our change maker. This is, uh, I will leave you now in the extremely capable hands of changemaker Salma Mahamud. She's an award-winning BBC Young Reporter and a kick-it-out game-changer. She's 19 and she's studying sports 
Psychology at the University Campus of Football Business, which is based in Wembley Stadium. Salma also plays football for Brentford Women's Development Team, and she coaches as well. This is her very thoughtful exploration of what she's been through and what it means to be a role model. I'm Kate Bulkley. Please enjoy Salma. Thank you very much for being with us. As a black Muslim woman, some may say I have all the cards stacked against me. And whilst it certainly felt that way on a number of occasions growing up, I now realize I've been put in a unique position to help change the narrative. My footballing journey began at the age of 11, and it didn't take me long to realize that there weren't a lot of girls that looked like me playing. This made me feel like an outsider, and as though I didn't belong, that the sport I love more than anything, maybe it just wasn't for me. A mixture of my love of the game and my stubbornness meant that I kept playing anyways. But there's a lot of girls that drop out from this same feeling. At my first club, Larkspur, I had a coach called Katie. She was one of the only female coaches I had at the time. And whilst I didn't know how big of an influence she would have on me down the line, what I did know was how special it felt having a female coach. How much more I felt I could relate to her and how much she inspired me. At the time, I had absolutely no plans of becoming a coach. But as I grew older, I began to think more of how much I really wanted to see someone that looked like me involved in football. And it started to feel like I had a responsibility to be that role model for the young girls of today. Looking back now, I realised how big of an influence Katie had on me believing that I could go into coaching. She made me see that in an industry full of men, there is space for women to thrive. It's like they say, if you can see it, you can be it. And Katie certainly made me believe that I could be it. I was very lucky to have had Katie because when I was growing up, there weren't very many people I could look up to as a role model. No matter how much fun I had playing or how good things were, the feeling of belongingness was what I always felt I lacked in football. Being the only Muslim girl on most of the teams I played for meant that dropping out was unfortunately something I thought of quite often. At the time, my parents also had their reservations about me playing, which only made it all the more difficult. Back then, I never really understood why they were so against me playing, and this often meant a lot of arguments and even more occasions of me sneaking out of the house to play playing every single game as though it was my last, because I genuinely believed it would be. As I've grown up, my parents have become more accepting and supportive of me playing, but there was never really a discussion as to why or how their opinion shifted. To be honest, I never really thought to question it, out of fear it would remind them, and they would change their minds again. But I was speaking as part of a panel for an event one day, um, with my dad in the audience, when I got asked if my parents supported me playing football and how this affected me growing up. I looked to my dad and smiled, thinking there was no way I could throw him under the bus, even though I had plenty of stories I could have shared. But I said my parents were always really supportive of me playing as a child, which couldn't have been further from the truth. On our way back home from that event, my dad asked me why I lied. I was silent not knowing what way this conversation was going to go. He ended up asking me if I knew why they were so against me playing. I said no. I never really thought about that. I was too busy thinking about how I'd sneak out of the house next. He told me I was out of fear. Fear of how I would be treated. He knew how harsh it could be for me as a visible Muslim female playing football. He knew it wasn't something a lot of Muslim girls do and so he thought I wouldn't be supported. But as I grew older, he saw how passionate and stubborn I was and had every belief that I would be all right. Looking back now, it's such a sad thought that they had to worry about whether I would be discriminated against and they had every reason to worry. Stereotypes and a lack of understanding mean I'm more likely and have unfortunately been discriminated against. It's the reason why I actively try and do everything I can to create change so that the next generation don't have to experience what I, and unfortunately many others, have had to. Whether that be through coaching and playing, 
where I can be a visual representation or speaking at events and getting my story out there to highlight my experiences. Whilst I'm a firm believer of being and creating the change you want to see, instead of waiting for someone else to do it, I can only reach a limited number of people. This is where different forms of media, such as TV and films, play a huge role. Children base a lot of their assumptions about themselves as well as others on the content that they watch. And whilst this can have a very positive impact by increasing their self-esteem and promoting positive messages, it can also have a negative impact. Children's media has certainly diversified over the years. However, it's still not where it could be or where it should be. Due to this lack of diversity and representation, there's been a shift from traditional TV to platforms such as YouTube. The, a key reason for this shift is because YouTube is a platform that gives individuals the freedom to create the content that's lacking in traditional TV shows. Young people can now easily access the content that they feel best represents them. As we often see, traditional media can perpetuate stereotypes and the negative portrayal of underrepresented backgrounds. Examples of this include the portrayal, portrayal of Muslim women as oppressed and the angry black woman narrative. These negative and inaccurate portrayals fuel stereotypes and the discrimination of these groups. It's also important to remember that the lack of representation can have just as negative an effect on groups as inaccurate portrayal. If young people aren't seeing themselves in their favorite TV shows or in TV shows full stop, they begin to feel invisible and unimportant. In the words of the brilliant diet Viola Davis, if they exist in life, then we should see it in TV and accurately portrayed, might I add. It's time now to take a deeper look and ask the important questions of am I doing enough and are we doing enough to ensure that we're not adding fuel to the fire and that we aren't sitting around doing nothing. The time for excuses has long passed.